Hi guys, this is the third chat, third segment of chapter two. Uh, I stopped at the uh, conglomerate and braccia. So the next one is the sandstone. Remember the sandstone has category, grain size category of, of 0.2 uh, millimeter and 0.063 millimeter. Two, between 2 millimeter and 0.063. Uh, we have to know three kind of sandstone. Remember the arcos, the gray rocky, and the quartz sandstone. Uh, the quartz sandstone is 100% quartz. Uh, the arcos have about 25% K feldspar, and of course, it has some biotype, possibly amphibole, and then quartz. So the arcos is pretty immature. Uh, usually, grains are very irregular and angular. You have to check this under the microscope in the lab to make sure that actually you see that. And um, most of the time that means that the arc was formed right next to the granite mountain. So it didn't get traveled too much. So it's pretty immature. Uh, the other one you'll have to know is the gray rocky. And the gray rocky is also pretty uh, immature. And uh, usually it has every kind of rock fragments and quartz in it. And then you got the quartz sandstone. And the quartz sandstone, basically, if it's 100% quartz in it, it's going to be the most mature sedimentary, uh, very mature sedimentary rock. So those are the three kinds of sandstone you'll have to know. And uh, the sandstone are actually very important because it, if you look at them under the microscope and you look at the sorting, the grain size, the mineral composition, it will give you information about the transport the what transported it like if it was um, wind it completely got rounded and the distance how far did it go from the source area and um, usually they are pretty um, high energy environment means that even if it made to the beach it's gonna stay in the wave zone and everywhere on the continent the environment is pretty high energy um, except of course in the coastal swamps so that's important to know the next one is the siltstone and by the time the grain size gets to siltstone usually you, we are pretty far from the source area like usually it's on a peneplain flat area where the rivers are meandering and um so it's pretty close to the beach and these rocks are mostly quartz and clay so they are pretty mature and um they are relatively low energy environment and the next one is the finest grain size where you have uh, the, the grains are less than 0 0.005 millimeter which you basically cannot even fill with your with your hands so therefore when you touch it it feels kind of greasy and the silt I didn't mention the silt was between point uh, 6.063 and 0.005 millimeters so it's not very easy sometimes to tell apart the shell from the from the siltstone now in between you know in this category it's not only shell but you also have the mudstone when you have shell the difference is that it's split into smaller layer we call it fissile so that's the fiss fissile or fissility and now we are at the chemical or biochemical, biochemical sedimentary rocks. And this is the group where the carbonates belong. The carbonates are all uh, chemical sedimentary rocks which precipitate out from the ocean, mostly. There are some other cases. And they all have carbonates in them. But they can have different cations. One important thing about them that mostly form in the tropical area. So here on earth, I'm showing you where the tropical area right there. And usually where you have carbonate formation, the water has this very characteristic blue color. Like probably some of you've been in the Caribbean and you've seen the ocean there. That is the color of the carbonate forming environment usually. Uh, the Bahamas, like if you went to Jamaica, Belize, Mexico, this is the color. Cuba, this is the color you're going to see. You will have to know the first group is going to be the limestone. The limestones, the limestones are all calcium carbonate. So when you drop some hydrochloric acid, it will fizz. And uh, calcium carbonate is CaCO3, Ca. -C 
and then the carbonate. So the ion is calcium and you have the carbonate CaCO3. That is the formula and when you drop hydrochloric acid on it, it will react with the hydrochloric acid and make uh, water, uh, calcium chloride, water and CO2 and the CO2 bubbles out and that's the effervescence of fizzing. The, you will have to know three different kind of limestone. The first one is the oolitic limestone. In, in uh, areas such as the Bahamas, that's where I collected some oolites, uh, if, if actually the, it has to be shallow water, very shallow. The climate has to be just a little bit arid. If the climate is just a little bit arid, the, the seawater will evaporate so the leftover water is going to be super saturated in, in calcium carbonate and because it's high energy so the waves are going back and forth and itty bitty pieces of any kind of rocks or mineral pieces in the water start to go back and forth and as they go back and forth itty bitty tiny calcium carbonate layers precipitating on it, on them. And so therefore you're going to end up with these low sediments, which are calcium carbonate, so it will fizz with hydrochloric acid, which are going to be perfect circles. We call them oids. And the, the stone itself is called oolitic limestone. Oolites or oids. This is how you pronounce them more or less. Okay, so this is high energy environment and arid. That's very, very characteristic for these guys. And the next one is Coquina. Coquina is a sedimentary rock, I mean a carbonate limestone, which is nothing but shell fragments as you can see. So it's somewhat similar to the classic sedimentary rocks, except if you put acid on this, it's going to fizz big time. So because it's all broken shell fragments, you can tell that it forms in the, in the coastal, the very high energy wavy zone. And it mostly humid environment because if it was arid, there would be oolites in it too. I've seen coquina with oolites in it, so you know that that means that it's relatively arid environment. But like in this situation, it's nothing but but uh, shell fragments, no oolites, so therefore it's humid environment. Yeah, so this is kind of important because it can tell you about the change of the climate like uh like in florida if you go to the keys uh underneath you you find all the limestone limestone but today it's coquina which is forming so you know there was a climate change there now this one is the fossiliferous limestone it's hard to say fossiliferous fossiliferous limestone when you have fossiliferous limestone that means that it uh it it is very fine grained carbonate with fossils in it and in this case the color is just going to tell you further information about how much oxygen was in the environment so the color can be any in this case and um, it just because of the fine grain that means low energy environment and a lot of the times deeper water deeper water okay low energy deeper water environment and this here is the lime mudstone, and the lime mudstone is the finest grain size. It's usually quite deeper water, so the dark color is very, very common if there was no oxygen around because it's just deeper water. This is the hockey, hockey stone, so that just means that it formed at relatively shallow depth, and um, it still fizzes. So in this case, the color just tells you if it was deeper water of, or if or if it was shallower water, it's still limestone, so it will fizz with the hydrochloric acid, lime, mudstone. The next rock you'll have to know is the dolomite. Now, the dolomite is calcium magnesium carbonate, so when you put hydrochloric acid on it, it will fizz, but just a little bit, much less than the, the limestones itself. Um, these rocks usually represent extreme arid environment. When dolomite starts forming, the environment is pretty arid, means no rain. Uh, the dolomite always forms from pre-existing limestone by, um, you know, the limestone is calcium carbonate, the dolomite is calcium magnesium carbonate. So 
the original limestone has all the calcium in it, calcium in it, but when the when the water gets um, less and less, it becomes more and more super saturated, so gypsum starts to form. And for the calcium sulfate, it needs calcium, and a lot of the times there is not enough, so the magnesium actually will build into the dolomite crystals and kick out the calcium for the gypsum. So during arid climates, the limestones usually will uh, go into dolomite and you will start seeing gypsum and, and, and hydrite and halite and, and, and um, uh, potassium salt also. So dolomite is the first uh, sign of aridity. Also, don't forget, it could also be called dolostone. So dolomite or dolostone, they are synonyms. Uh, and this takes us to the evaporites. Evaporates. Evaporates form an extreme arid environment and their formation is defined by the solubility. Solubility is how easily a mineral can dissolve in water. And you all know that the salt, the halite, dissolves pretty easily. And there is the potassium salt which dissolves even more easily than the, the salt. So this order here is the solubility older so this is more soluble this way more soluble soluble i still cannot write really nicely like this more soluble okay so gypsum is the least soluble that means that this is going to be the first one to crystallize the next step will be anhydrite, and then the salt, and finally the potassium salt. Uh, you don't really have to know the formulas, but I did write it down just for you. The next sedimentary rock you will have to know is the chert, and the chert is SiO2, as you see, so it's equal with the quartz, like in composition. But chert almost always a so-called diagenetic mineral. Diagenetic mineral means that it forms after the sediment formed already. Diagenetic. diagenetic mineral so that means that it will form after the sedimentary rock become a sedimentary rock and uh, let's say you had dolomite or limestone with like salt nodules in it ch chunk of salt showing extreme arid environment but later on the waters go through these rocks the the salt and the potassium salt dissolves so you're gonna have empty holes and Later on, the chert will crystallize in that. It's very, very common in Virginia. Like if you go toward Lexington, but anywhere around here, a lot of the limestone has chert nodules in it, which are basically replacing evaporate uh, nodules. So the, the chert replacing the evaporate nodules. Remember, what is the name of Roanoke originally? Yes, it's Big Lake. What does that mean? Everybody knows that, that the animals used to come around here and licking the salt. So this, some of the salt are still in these rocks, but a lot of them has dissolved and replaced by, by chert. And actually, Roanoke had gypsum. We'll talk about this later some more. The next one is the coal. And this is just a map showing you all the coal-forming locations in the U.S. Every time there was coal-forming... Um, there is always coal is forming originally in coastal swamps like Virginia Beach, Everglades is a really great environment for coal formation. That just means that it has to be humid. It is very close to the ocean usually and it has to be, uh, I told you already, very humid. So you have a lot of uh, trees and it's like really dense, heavy forest. And... Um, when the trees die, they fall down and get covered by clay, so the oxygen cannot get to it, and it starts to become more and more enriched in carbon because, uh, as I said, it cannot get to it. So as it gets buried, 
and pressure building up everything else goes away but the carbon stays so it's gonna get better and better coal as it gets buried deeper and deeper so the coal formation is a is a slow process and it goes through stages of coal formation that any stage you can already burn and get energy out of them but the better the coal the more energy you get out the more heat you can get out so there is a basically there is a whole lot of different kinds starting with the peat the peat the peat is the weakest coal it has only 65 percent carbon in it so there is a lot of ash when you burn you get some heat out of it but there's a lot of ash the next one here is the lignite lignite the lignite has about 75 percent carbon and about 25% ash lignite. And last semester you had to learn the bituminous coal, which is right here. Bituminous. That's 8515. And then you remember the metamorphic coal is the anthracite. Bituminous. Oh. Uh, and then the anthracite. Anthracite is 95% pure carbon. Here, I wrote them all down. So, peat is 65, 35, uh, lignite is 75 carbon, 25% uh, ash. The bituminous coal is 85, 15, and the anthracite is 95, 5. It's easy. To remember so that's the coal and we just finished all the sedimentary rocks so it's really important that you will know them and I will come back in the next segment so see you for them see you for now I should say